Hello, this is Val Black, and we're talking about Covenant again today. Uh, I'm here in my shop, and uh, it's kind of a mess, so I'm not going to show you around at all. <laughs> but this is session three on, of my series on covenants. Now, the title of today's message is, What is a Covenant? And in our last video, I said there are two questions many people ask. Does God love me, and how can I know that? And can I trust God? You know, it's my belief that with the exception of Jesus Christ dying at Calvary, there's no better way God has shown his love and proven he is trustworthy than he has through the covenant relationship he has already made for anyone who has faith. A covenant is a fundamental part of a Christian's walk with God. And many Christians don't understand covenant or covenant relationships. You know, you could be doing all the right things like going to church, paying tithes, singing in the choir, be a greeter, an usher, take up the collection, or teaching Bible class, or you can even be a pastor. You could be doing one or all these things and still feel there is something missing in your walk with God. Well, by understanding covenants and covenant relationships, you'll gain a new, a new perspective, an exciting view of the Bible. What, and what is most important, you'll have to develop a closer relationship with God. So let's get started here in understanding covenant. Well, first, we'll define the word covenant. What is it? Well, a covenant is a, an agreement, a pact or a contract between two parties. It is binding and unbreakable. Now, the most sacred kind of a covenant is a blood covenant. Today's world, we don't like to talk about blood, and especially we don't want to hear it from the pulpit, do we? Well, that's sad because covenant is a foundation of the Bible. Everything the the old the prophets did in the Old Testament and everything they said the life and death and resurrection of Jesus in the New Testament, those were all fulfillment of covenants. You know, the gods of other religions don't offer man a blood covenant relationship, or any relationship for that matter. Hinduism, New Age, Buddhism, Islam, none of them offer to have a relationship with man, like the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Christianity. And that was made possible by the sacrifice of God's only Son, Jesus Christ. Now you may wonder, how can we know God in a personal way, as a close, close friend? Someone you can count on to help you when you need it. Someone who knows all of your faults but loves you anyway. Fulfilling covenants was a key to achieving that goal. Now covenant is in the plural sense because Getting to know God personally required the fulfillment of many covenants. Acts 15, verse 18 says this, Known to God from eternity are all his works. That means God is omniscient. Now that's just a long fancy word. Omni is Latin for all. Scientia, meaning knowledge. You put them together, it's all knowledge. Om God is omniscient. God knows it all because he has all knowledge. He never had to learn anything, and he never will because he knows everything. Before God even created the heavens and earth, and before he created Adam, he knew Adam would disobey him, so he already had a plan put in place to redeem mankind from the penalties of Adam's sin. You know, that Garden of Eden was meant to be an eternal home for Adam and Eve, but since they sinned and fell from the grace of God, they were banned from the garden because God cannot fellowship with evilness. And Adam's personal relationship was broken because God is holy and Adam had become evil through sin. But praise God for his grace because he didn't, God didn't leave it like that. In Genesis chapter 3, God announced to Adam, Eve, and the devil, who was disguised as a serpent, what was going to happen to restore man's relationship with God. Now, if you have your Bibles, you can read along with me. Genesis 3, verses 14 through 19. 
So the Lord said to the the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. You des- your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife, and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you should eat of it for all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field, and the sweat of your face you shall break bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. That, uh, and uh, that word enmity, there it means hatred. Uh, <clears throat> the sentence, he shall bruise your head, is referring to devils, the devil's final defeat by Jesus. You shall bruise his heel is a reference to Jesus being crucified on the cross. Uh, interesting, it's interesting that archaeologists have found the ankle bone of a man who had been crucified. That nail was still in the bone, and it had been driven through the side of the foot near the heel. Now, it's believed that that was the way they did The Romans did it in that time. It was through the side of the foot near the heel instead of on top of the foot like we, sh- we see in so many paintings. The bruising, the heel of Jesus, was a partial fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. The total fulfillment of Jesus' victory over the devil would happen when Jesus returns to earth, sets up his kingdom, rules from Jerusalem, and after a thousand years, the devil will be cast into the lake of fire forever as it's described in the book of Revelation. I want to read that to you. Revelation 20, verse 10, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Take that, devil. You know, from Genesis to Revelation, God had devised a plan, and that plan was implemented through various covenants. We know that plan is the plan of redemption. Now, why did God choose covenants to do that? Well, as far back as Adam, covenants have been known to men. And in the book, The Blood Covenant by H.R. Trumbull, uh, the author states that blood covenant was an ancient primitive rite uh, found all around the world and still being used today in some places. You know, Ancient people understood blood covenants much better than we do today. Uh, Blood covenants were used to bond friendships, and they were actually considered to be sacred rites. Let's stop here a minute. Have you ever flown in a plane, and on a clear day at about 30,000 feet, you look down to earth, And it's almost impossible to distinguish a person on earth or even a house sometimes. You know, I've done that a few times myself. And it never fails to amaze me how God can look down from as far above as he is in heaven and see me, not only see me, but He wants to have a personal relationship with me and you, just like he had with Adam in the Garden of Eden when they walked together. Now, have you ever felt that way before? If you have flown in the plane. God wants you and me to know him in a very personal way. And that way was made possible by Jesus dying in your and my place, 
for our sins. Now I have illustrated that process or rather God's plan of redemption and how he is working out he, uh, his plan through covenants. So I'm going to pause right here and uh, you're probably tired of looking at me anyway. <laughs> so I'm going to give you a close up of a chart that I put together. And actually, I just kind of made it up out of a, a book I read. Uh, so, but this, this really illustrates what we're going to be talking about. And I believe if you even see the chart, uh, you're going to have a better view of the Bible. And it's going to give you a different perception, I hope, I believe, a, a better perception that, than you may already have. So anyway, I'll stop there and we'll go to the chart, okay? Bye-bye. Okay, here's a chart showing the various covenants beginning with number one covenant on the top left-hand side. I'm not going into detail on all of these covenants now, but we will look at each one in detail in later sessions. The covenants begin with the covenant of creation at the top left. In that covenant, God created everything, including Adam and Eve. They had the privilege of walking with God in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve fell, but God already had a plan put in place that would restore their fellowship with him. That plan included the covenants we see on the chart, from the covenant of creation all the way through to the new covenant on the top right-hand side. There you see the cross, which is a symbol of Jesus making a way for mankind to be restored into fellowship with God. Hebrews 4, verse 16 says, Let us come boldly before the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And Galatians chapter 4, verse 6 says, Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his son into your hearts, cry out, Abba, Father. Well, that's a good thought to end on for today. Thank you for watching, and God bless you. Bye-bye.